Well, ultimately, the decision to do anything about an animal's welfare is an ethical decision. So it's us who decides whether when we see an animal in the street that is covered with sores, that is physically sick, is physically malnourished, it's up to us to decide whether that's a good or a bad thing or something we don't care about. That's where the ethics comes in. Essentially, the ethics is, is, is where human intervention arises. When we look at something and we determine that this situation is morally wrong, we should not allow this situation to exist, we need to do something about it. But yes, ultimately it all boils down to human ethics and, and our decisions about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Animal welfare is essentially, uh, it essentially refers to how an animal is faring, how it's doing uh, in its current situation. Um, and we can say that an animal is doing well or it's doing badly uh, based on how it appears to be feeling in its current situation. Obviously, we can't ask the animal how it's feeling, so we have to make inferences about how it's feeling about its situation from its behavior, uh, things that are happening inside it, its physiology, and so on. Some of our production practices obviously uh, cause animals distress, cause animals fear, cause animals pain. And uh, the question then is how much pain and distress is acceptable for uh, an animal. And uh, uh, so we have to make subjective judgments to some extent in terms of what we are going to allow uh, with respect to animal production practices uh, and uh, decide where to draw the line, if you like, and say this is too much, this, we're inflicting too much suffering on the animal, we won't do that. Well, there are indirect impacts on the food chain. So, for example, just to give you an example, uh, an animal that is uh, experiencing poor welfare, that could have an impact on, say, its immune system. So it can have a suppressing, suppressing effect on its immune system uh, due to processes that occur in the body of the animal. And if its immune system is suppressed, then it may be more susceptible to diseases like uh, Salmonella, uh, E. coli, that can then be transmitted to humans. So by, uh, for example, m making a farm animal or a food animal experience poor welfare, uh, we can increase the chances that that animal's carcass or that animal's eggs uh, will be more infective to humans. So it can have a direct impact on human uh, health and well-being. Um, in a market-driven economy, in an economy where it's just about you know, producing uh, products as cheaply as possible so that consumers can, uh, can buy it as inexpensively as possible and with producers competing with each other, that tends to shift everything down to the lowest common denominator, if you like. And that tends to push animals right into a corner in terms of their welfare. Um, and so I think at that point, you know, regulation has to clarify where the line is drawn. You know, how far we're allowed to push animals into situations in which they're suffering or experiencing pain or or being frightened or distressed by what we do to them. Ultimately, I think the consumer has to pay. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there about how much more consumers would have to pay in order to have uh, so-called welfare-friendly uh, uh, food pr products. Um, some estimates imply that you could achieve uh, substantial improvements in welfare for as little as a 10% hike in, say, the price of eggs or meat or something. Uh, others are claiming, oh, it would cause a 25% hike or a 50% hike. The truth of the matter is that there would be economies of scale, so that the more, the more if you like, uh, that production is, is shifted to 
a new high welfare level, the cheaper it will become because uh, uh, producers will find ways of economi economizing in other respects. Thank you.